going to hand you over to Chris, who's going to tell you about how we got on this year. So, Chris, oh, yeah. Cheers, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, and just one of the things, that, before I forget, I think we all just need to give Bob a huge cheers, but thanks to Bob for organising things. Bob, thank you. Um, I think it's credit to Bob that we're all here, and um, it's done a great job of kind of corralling people as coming and talking. Um, my name is Chris. Um, I've been mapping on OpenStreetMap for a while, but um, I, I just kind of want to. I was kind of thinking about why do we map, and one of the things I love about, I just map because I like maps. I don't think, I, you know, different people have different things, but um, I was trying to find it when I was at home when I grew up, I had like, I used to map the local neighbourhood. I actually was looking at an open street map and it doesn't look anything like the maps I had, but the patterns were there, um, and that's one of the reasons I map. And when I discovered open street map, I got going. So that's just a bit about myself. I kind of work in telecoms and don't have anything to do with maps through my day job. So it's just a hobby for me at the moment. Um, this talk, I just want to talk a little bit about OpenStreetMap and kind of what the patterns of what I think is happening in OpenStreetMap just generally and also um, in Scotland over the last, last year or so. Um, so one thing that I think has definitely happened and changed is actually I've seen some money in OpenStreetMap. Um, probably one of the biggest things is um, you know, ITO were talking about at the same amount that they've actually been paying people to fill in some of the gaps in the UK, some of the streets that weren't mapped. Um, they've been paying people to do that. Um, one of the other big things that's starting to make a difference is um, there's, a, there's a, a bunch of funding, which I think was $575,000 basically given out to basically help fund work on the OpenStreetMap website and some of the tools. And I think that, that's starting to make a real difference in the website. Uh, at the moment, the changes are quite, are quite subtle, so the biggest thing that's really changed is that sidebar at the side. So when you look at the website, it's not got big changes from the front page, although I've seen some of their plans for other things, you can they can do more the public, so there's going to be yeah, the toolbar at the side. So there's going to be other changes later on in the year. But I actually really like what they've done. Um, and it goes onto the map layers, and actually it's a really nice way of showing what OpenStreetMap's about and some of the great things. So I'm actually just going to work down that map layers on the, on the front page, talking about some of the things in those layers and how they work. Um, so we're going to start with the, the default, what's called the standard layer. Um, it's been, it's been around for ages. One of the things, it looks the same as it did for a long time, but actually the, the way it works underneath has changed. Andy Allen has kind of completely rewritten it from nasty, really, really nasty thousands and thousands of lines of XML to a language called Carto CSS, which is a bit more manageable and actually is a bit more human readable and understandable. And importantly, there's some tools that make editing that much better, which means that if you want to take that layer and add things to it, hopefully put patches in for it, um, actually, that's much easier than it ever has been before. Um, so that's the standard layer. Um, one of the other layers that I actually think is really important is the cycle layer. Um, so that's the cycle layer, which is the next, next layer down. One thing I think in Scotland, certainly, cyclists are probably one of the biggest groups of users of OpenStreetMap. Um, and I think probably one of the things that affects that is the tools that OpenStreetMap has. So there's things like um, cycle streets, um, Cycle streets makes a huge that loads of people use cycle streets, and for most people, for a lot of people, it's probably I think certainly in the cycling community, probably the first place they'll see OpenStreetMap is in is in cycle streets. This was me doing a map um, across to visit some friends yesterday from work. Um, and there's also other things going on, so it's really good to see um, people like Cycling Scotland are actually behind OpenStreetMap, and um, they've done some some. You know, they've been running training forces, Bob and Tim have been involved in. Um, I went along to, maybe it was, I'm not sure if it was this year or it was the previous year, but actually it's really amazing to see kind of a dozen, 20 people actually learning how to edit OpenStreetMap. And it's kind of quite eye-opening when you watch someone trying to edit OpenStreetMap for the first five years, just from some of the, the things like actually um, email addresses. Um, you wouldn't have thought of it, but some people had signed up at work and then they forgot their passwords, but they didn't have access to their work email, or they hadn't validated, and things like that, which get in the way. But actually, once they work on running and editing, you know, it's great to see people just kind of write, I'm going to edit that, I'm going to put in this, I'm going to do that. Um, so that's, that's cycling, and that's one of the really big, really big communities that we, you know, that we have, and one of the really big ways of doing it. Um, I think most of you know we have kind of regular pub meetups, so we meet up in Edinburgh 
once every three months, Glasgow and in Stirling. So the Stirling one is now actually meeting at the Boy Club in Stirling, partly because we couldn't find a decent pub in Stirling. I don't know what that was about. Um, but actually, that's a good way of, of, of engaging in that community. And actually, potentially, you know, not everywhere we meet probably should have beers because actually that's not, that's not a place for everyone to go, potentially. So that's something to think about. Um, the next layer down on the list is the public transport layer. So this is just showing the crazy amount of bus bus routes around Glasgow, Queen Street and Glasgow. Um, I don't see this stuff in big impacts at the moment, but it's, it's a really good, good layer. Um, it's also worth highlighting there's a MapQuest, Ma MapQuest layer, and they're actually for people that want to sort of, I remember someone saying that they weren't using OpenStreetMap because, you know, there wasn't a really good source of tiles. Um, I can't remember who it was, but then I, I just thought the other day, actually MapQuest tiles are there, they're free to use, um, and then they've got, and so they're actually a really good alternative if you want to use an embed OpenStreetMap in your website. Um, you need tiles, you can have too many to take from OpenStreetMap tile service directly or you're concerned about that. Um, you don't want to pay for someone like the cloud made with the um, Mapbox tiles. Um, the MapQuest tiles are there and you can use them, so that's actually really good. Um, there's also a new layer that came on board this year, which is the humanitarian layer. Um, I tried to use all my maps from you know, in Scotland in the talk, but actually there's not anywhere in Scotland that really shows off what's the military layer. This is a section of Glasgow. Um, you can see the fire stations and the police and, you know, highlighted. Um, but to actually see the real impact of that layer, all the really interesting stuff, you need to look at somewhere like in Haiti, where it's got things like um, water, water's highlighted, but there's also things like road conditions. So you can see there's a difference between the roads, between paved and unpaved streets, so you can see that. So it's just another layer of detail, um, and it's also quite a nice background layer. It's kind of designed for organisations who want to layer information on top. Um, um, so with all the state, the other item on the, on the layers is data. And, um, one of the big changes is, is, a, is the new is the new editor. So I'm going to try a demo of the of the of the ID editor. Who here has edited OpenStreetMap before? So most of us have, but not everybody. So for those who haven't op edited OpenStreetMap, I just want to show you how simple it can be. Just get my browser over, hopefully. Just maybe I've mirrored my screens. Um, right, so here's OpenStreetMap. Um, I'm going to zoom in on the area. Um, one of the things I you may have read is that the trams have actually started running. Um, and so I was going to change from the tram line from under construction to in work. So here we've got the tram line coming to the depot. That bit they've been testing for a while, but this section here I actually saw a tram on it. Um, <laughs> live port of tram. So we've come in here and I'm just going to go to the open street map. Obviously the thing here is the edit button. You hit the edit button. If you've not got an account, you'll need to log in, then you get the, the new editor. Um, so there's a background image there, which is provided by, by Bing. Um, and then if we click on the line, you can see it's a tram. And further up here, it's, it's a railway. If you look at the tags. Construction tram, railway construction. So I think what we want to do is change that to railway. I made a note of exact changes. Railway tram. And construction. Yeah. We just need to get rid of the construction. It's no longer construction. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, tram, right? Ah. <laughs> yeah. Tram. So that is making an edit to the street map. And then we can save that. Um, with a little comment, so please can see what I've done, and that is an edit. So that's how easy it is to edit OpenStreetMap. I think that's kind of amazing, um, and that's certainly easier than it's ever been before. Um, the other thing I, when I was planning that cycle route yesterday, that I showed up in the earlier slide, um, I've got a GPS trace. So I can drag my GPS trace onto the map, um, and there's a new crossing which is here. And to do that, I'm going to draw a line, and I can just draw the crossing in.
And there we go. We've added that. And then we need to, we need to, um, we need to finish the line first by clicking the last point of the bar. There we go. Finish the line. And then we want to say that as it's a cycleway. Cycle path. There we go. And we added that as a cycle path. Um, there's some other things we can add to that, and I'll go back and do that later, like general access there, and we can access it. Um, there's also some traffic lights here, so we can go here, and we can say it's we we'll say it's traffic traffic signals. It's probably highway. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a crossing rather than traffic signals. True. I'll, I'll sort that in a moment. There we go. Anyway, that is how to do it. I'll not say that it is. But that's how easy it is to edit. Um, right, back to the presentation, which is a bit where it always goes wrong. Hey, so that didn't go too badly. Um, there's some other thoughtful things like the new notes feature. Um, we all, I think it's always interesting to show the, always like to show the map of the zoo that we did on a mapping party a while ago. Um, but. I was having a look at the, the new, I turned on the notes layer, and there's a note there to say that the Wolverine had moved, update required. And actually, that, that's just a really nice way. I don't know who added it, um, or why they added it, but it's definitely something that needs to be fixed up. And it's good to see that there's a note there. Um, the other thing I noticed when I jumped onto this layer is actually, um, we're in the humanitarian layer, which doesn't show the names of the, the, the the plants, you can see the cycle map layer, or the standard layer, or even the map plus layer would have had the, had the names on there. This layer doesn't, but it does show the benches. Um, and I was like, hey, I think I mapped those benches. I couldn't quite, I, I wasn't, you know, then a moment stopped, stopped, and I said, did I map those benches? I think Bob was like, are you happy the benches? Um, but what's great about OpenStreetMap is you can go, you can click on the, the map data layer, you get like the vector layer on top. I can actually then click on the bench, and I can see when I added the bench. So I did add the bench. Um, and there's actually a layer on the front page that three years later actually shows the benches in the map. Um, so I quite like that. There's also the history in there, which I think is just really powerful. You can look at how things have changed over time. Nobody's used the bench or updated the bench, so uh, benches don't tend to move. So I think that's probably okay. Talking of things that get rendered, um, up until very recently, the sounder layer that we talked about would zoom up to, to zoom 18, so that's effectively you can zoom into the map, you can hit, hit that plus button 18 times. And if you do that in the centre of Edinburgh on the Royal Mile, you can kind of go that far, but not many people know this, but actually now it goes to zoom level 19, which is that level of detail, um, which I means that you can potentially start showing things like benches that will probably cut plus of the, the, the higher zooms on that layer. Um, and that's, you know, there's a lot more detail. If you look at the scale on the previous one, the scale on the bottom left hand corner was kind of 30 meters sort of for that much. And then, so that's actually, you yeah, know, if you think about that's what, you yeah, know, a block of 10 meters is, that's pretty detailed. Um, that, uh, I guess that's opening the floodgates to do more detailed mapping. Um, other things I've seen on the map that I quite like, someone mapped that farmer's stinking chicken farm. Um, they're right, it does smell. Um, my cycle group goes between Chicken farm and the new and the new um, donut place, um, and that's a bad mixture of smells. So I can definitely agree with them. Uh, there's also been some other mapping going on. We did a whole bunch of remote mapping for for a party for a, around a mapping party in advance of a mapping party, and there was a mapping party in the black hour. And actually, I think it was really powerful and brilliant to be able to help out like the local community up there by basically providing remote support. And actually. The extra detail, I think, just really makes the map come alive. So before we started, most of the forest, most of the green area there wasn't there. And actually, just filling in those details, um, I found a road, like a, a road that hadn't been mapped and things in advance. Actually, means kind of helps them along, because actually, I think when there's just a few people getting started, there's a lot of work to do. So I think, you know, then there's other people around that are supporting it. Generally, armchair mapping, you know, there's a bit of a debate about whether it's good or bad. But I think in cases where you're helping out people on the ground, whether it be kind of on the humanitarian side, or even just on the local community side, like in that case, I think it can be really good. Um, still have reservations about doing a whole load of mapping somewhere that nobody's ever then going to look at and check, or if there are people around to support it. Um, but that's good. And there is still some work to be done on there. Um, one of the things I noticed in solid repair was that the coastline is very, very zigzaggy. Um, when you zoom in on in the editor, you can see that the, <laughs> there's the coastline zigzagging, and you can see the actual coastline. Because it's kind of an estuary, it's kind of hard to be sure exactly where the coastline is, but 
the reality is nothing like as complicated as, as we make it look. So um, I think there's probably quite a lot of chip fixes like that that can still happen. Um, there's also the mapping done in Dunbar, and I think Tim's going to talk a bit more about this in his talk, so I'm not going to go too much about it. But again, I think this kind of general theme of, of this kind of green mapping, whether it's to be looking at um, cycling or transport links or orchards or access to open spaces, I think is a really interesting theme, and I think it's really good to see what kind of communities we can kind of build up on that and from that. Um, and what, what kind of things do people want to see mapped and how can we help map that? So um, I'm kind of, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm interested in mapping. So if people kind of say to me, oh, it'd be really good to have this mapped, I'll probably just go and map it because I'm a bit like that. Um, yeah, so these were some of the things that Dunbar were interested in, public transport, local cycle paths, street limits, and lighting. I've never, I've never actually mapped any lighting yet. So, but once you know that people are actually interested in that and they are going to use it and they're using it to, you kind of go, oh, actually, it makes sense to map it. Um, there's also been some other kind of fun things that we did a whole load of stuff in Glasgow um, with the Mac Lab, which kind of we did some laser printed maps, but they're also looking at 3D mapping. Um, and this map was which kind of looks okay in 2D. Bob did a lot of work and we, we, we managed to map that. And there's a there's a 3D renderer for OpenStreetMap. Um, and it is actually possible to get to quite a lot of details. I don't know if you'd necessarily want to, because the tools aren't really designed around it. It's a, it is a bit of a that it does kind of mess with your head, but it's, it's amazing that that is actually possible and that depth of de detail of maps can actually exist within OpenStreetMap. Um, and actually, if you go to the web browser version, things like the, the water fountain is animated as well, so you actually get, get a, a moving picture there. Um, also, every year in Scotland, we have kind of something that we do first, we map before anybody else. Um, one of my favourites is this bridge that was the bridge to nowhere. Um, it's now the bridge to somewhere. Um, it's, called, uh, it's called the Anderson Bridge and it has LinkedIn and I think I kind of read the news article about, about that opening and went and checked an open street map and yes we had it mapped and it was connected um, which is always good news. Um, so that's kind of the end of my kind of quick tour of kind of things in open street map. Um, so what kind of progress are we making, how are things changing? This is going to be the last time I showed these slides. I've been kind of since the first stage of the map, we're going to be doing a kind of a comparison. We have a, a set of data, that, all in survey data of street networks. And we've kind of been doing this comparison. And to start with, it was quite interesting. If you look at the 2011 numbers, this kind of a top and a bottom of the league table for Scotland. So this is the top half. And actually, the top half has always looked pretty good. And this top half, you know, in 2011, Renfrewshire was at like 82%. It's now 97.5%. Um, yeah, there's maybe 60 odd roads that are missing, or not quite right. Everywhere is looking really good. Um, few areas, uh, yeah, actually I'll talk a bit about this later. I think anything within 5% is, is pretty, you know, it's pretty much comparable in terms of, of, of completeness from a road network point of view, not necessarily from other points of view, but from road networks and road names, which basically means that in terms of using it as an open street map as a kind of alternative to something like Google Maps or that kind of thing, that we're, we're definitely on a path, if not better in a lot of ways. Um, bottom half of the league table, I noticed there were some pretty poor places there. There were places that when we started this, um, were getting 80 ish percent. And actually, everywhere is now within 5% of that, that total mark. Um, it's kind of fun to have a look around. So, I had a look around Edinburgh at what the few percent that we were missing were. Um, and there's a, there's a, I did this for the main state of the map conference. I didn't redo really these slides, but there's one, two, three, four, five, five places that were kind of out. So, We'll just have a quick look at what they are because I think it's quite interesting to have a look. Now this one is slightly awkward because when I did this talk last year, this was one of the ones that came up and a year later it's still there. Um, it's because it's the airport and I, I, I personally, I don't like the cycle to the airport, so <laughs> I've not been to the airport to check it. But it's whether that road is Armand Avenue or Alden Drive. Actually, I probably, it's not going to any houses on it, nobody lives there, I don't think anybody uses it for dressing. I don't think it really matters, so it's probably a low priority one, which is why it sits there. Um, there and needing needing some attention. So Almond Drive, slightly awkward. I had hoped to go and fix it yesterday, but I ran out of time. <laughs> this one here, yeah, apparently Haymarket Terrace. We don't have that, but actually, if you visit Haymarket Terrace, it looks like that at the moment. <laughs> it's because we've turned it into highway equals construction. Um, so that one will sort itself out um, in its own time. Um, one of the ones that got fixed between when I did these slides um, about a month ago and now. Was this, there was a little section there saying Norris and Place. Um, 
you look at that open street map, Morrison Place kind of ends, we used to have an ending much earlier than your survey map does. Um, but actually, it, users come in here and they've edited it and they've set it to be, I didn't quite get my screenshot right, they've set it to be, uh, meant to click on it, they meant to say it's not, they put a not tag in to say it's not Morrison Place, it's definitely a place, which means it, it drops it off that list. Um, there's another one that was quite interesting, and this area is an area that's in construction and kind of quite often comes up as it's quite one of the things that's quite nice about this tool is it kind of highlights areas where there's new houses that need a visit. So you can actually see that there's some every you know, as you can see that little area grow every time you do the comparison. Um, I actually thought, oh, use the new notes feature. So I did a note to say this needs double checking. And actually there was a map, there was a, a comment coming back from someone saying agreed, looks like I may have noted it down on when I surveyed it. You may have actually noted it right. It's probably just as likely to but also several many other roads being developed in this area, thanks. So actually, that's a really nice tool to actually communicate, and it's kind of nice to see the notes used kind of the way they were intended. Um, and I think that's really great. So the kind of current state of Edinburgh was, was that one. Um, now, what's also always worth pointing out is this not named section on the left. There's kind of 74 um, to 5. And actually what that means is that from what we've surveyed on the ground to what wouldn't survey have, we're kind of... There's about 3% difference, I think, roughly, um, in Edinburgh. And that actually means that when you look at other places and you say, ah, oh, it's 97%, well, actually, that 97 could be places that OpenStreetMap has right, just as likely as the other way. So that's kind of quite important, I think, um, when you use these tools, as they're not perfect in the data sets. So what do you add, when you add all that up, in 2011, we were kind of 93% on that comparison. Um, in 2012, we were 95. And in 2013, yeah, you add all the roads up, it's 98%. Um, so that, in a way, it's kind of, you look at the total number of roads, we've kind of only covered maybe 300 of those, but some of them are quite hard work, we've got to actually, you know, quite remote. Um, and that kind of maybe indicates that there's slowish progress. But when you actually look at what's happening in OpenStreetMap, this is just, if I do a raw data dump of OpenStreetMap data, what do we have? We've got, we've got 500, what we call, six, nearly 6 million in 2012, we have nearly 6 million nodes, which are just single points. We kind of have ways which we call our lines, effectively in relations of groups of lines, um, very simplistically. Um, but the increase is actually phenomenal. We've, we've added 41% to that total in terms of nodes, another 48% in ways, and 34% in relations. So that's actually, in terms of amount of map data that we have for Scotland, in, one, in less than one year, that's a huge growth. I think it's really impressive. Um, so what kind of makes up that data? We have names of things, so 46,000 named nodes and 150,000 named ways. And I think the kind of the trend actually is that as people map in more detail ways, you maybe put a point on, later on you might come back and turn that into a way, into an actual building or into more detailed things. So generally the, the ways are going up quicker. Um, we've got 8,087 named places. Um, and then highways, we've got a whole bunch of highways. Um, we've got unclassified highways, and we're going to go through all the numbers on these. Um, a whole bunch of things, ch -ch -ch. tracks, secondary roads, primary roads, tertiary roads, services, footways, paths. Now, path, I think, is one of the interesting ones because I think path is probably one of the areas that probably seems very low to me. I think we've probably got an awful lot more paths than we have maps, so that's probably one area that um, I think it would be interesting to think about is how do we actually get a lot more of the paths and the footways in Scotland mapped. Um, Trunk roads, so the, you know, the, the trunk road, you know, the, you actually, your big roads tend not to change that much from year to year. Cycleways, motorway roads, trunk links, pedestrian, bridleways, steps, 66 kilometres of steps. Mm -hmm. 155 kilometres are proposed. That one jumped up a lot this year, so people are adding roads that have just been proposed and primary links. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of, the, and cycleways is the other one, I think. I think, we, I think we had notes in cycleways, but it's very hard to know. It'd be interesting to know how we can find out what we're missing and what we don't have. Um, when you run these, kind of, I did a script to just kind of hunt through all, all the different highway types, you find some kind of interesting things. There's 30 metres of broken bridge, 13 kilometres of raceways, um, nearly a kilometre, well, thousand metres of kilometre of, of platforms, three metres of disuse, and 140 metres, four metres of wall. So. <laughs> Who knows what they are? Um, and then these are some of the, uh, there's about 2,000, no, about, yeah, I think there's over 2,000 people um, that have contributed to OpenStreetMap in Scotland. Um, I'll try to get all the names onto one slide and 
and I'm just about to like, recognize some of the names and some of the people in here. Um, so, the main thing is just to really, these are all the people that have made it. It's really about the people, OpenStreetMap. Um, it's really about kind of finding new people and new communities um, and working out what we as the existing community can do to encourage those and help them. Um, and that's what I think is going to be interesting. Thank you all. Yep. Um, so I, I loved everything you said. There's, I think there's, I think you should be slightly cautious over this issue of data quality. So you're saying you know, it's 97%, but of course you can measure quality in terms of its thematic completeness, its locational correctness. I mean, there's a whole variety of things to find quality, not just. Oh, no, no, definitely. I, that's what I was kind of saying. I, I think it's compared to, yeah, that's just looking at road networks. There's a lot of other things. Um, and I don't have time to, I think there's other things we need to start looking at, you know, what, what are we mapping? But it's just a nice way, I think it's a, it's a way of saying actually, I think from a road network, because that's just looking at the road network, um, we're, we're pretty good, but as I say, there's other things like paths and, and lots of other things, so there is more, definitely more work to be done. So yeah, no, I, I agree totally. Um, we're not there yet and there's a long way to go. Um, if you're considering quantity, you might consider quantity. Yeah. No, well, exactly. I, I think it'll. So it's, it's, a, it's a qualitative judgment. There isn't yeah. no. yeah. And there's some quite interesting things. Um, we're actually, one of the quite nice ways of looking at quality is actually to just look at how much activity there is in an area. How much is changing. If, you, if, if an area is active and there's, say, how many people have looked, are work mapping in an area and how, and how much activity is there. And that's actually quite a nice way without having to compare it against another data set of actually saying, this, yeah, I can actually trust the data that we have here because I can see there's lots of activity. And actually, that means there's people on the ground. That means there's people to spot things that are changing and actually adapt for them. So I think that's, that's one of the really interesting things. Yeah, I mean, the question is, what are the data sources that you can do these comparisons against? And the yeah. OS locator data is a really nice, easy example. Exactly. Uh, and so one of the other possible things that people look at is the routability. And if yes. you look at things like Scobbler, yeah. where, I don't know, I don't know exactly how it works, but I, I think that, you know, if you're driving along your car and the open street map data tells you to drive across a river, then you can press a button saying, I would rather yeah. use TomTom, -tom, please, and, and it will do some sort of automatic... Well, I think they put a notice in, they, yeah. and then go, so, yeah, that's basically what they're on that one. So yeah. the question is, what other sorts exactly. of data sets are there? What other routes are there for getting completeness? Yeah. And there's lots of, lots of academic work that people have done, so there are actually people writing papers on this stuff. It's a huge, you could probably do like hours of talks on quality. <laughs> you could do probably a whole day of people doing talks about the, the research that they're doing into OpenStreetMap quality. A, it, I, I think it is actually an interesting area. Um, because A, what do you compare against? Can you do it? And also, as I said, the thing that we're comparing it against, you, you very quickly discover that you know, this gold standard really isn't, isn't that great. Um, yeah. you know, I think just the streets at the top of that building there, I can't, what do they, have it? they have it in as something completely bonkers. And I was just like, yeah, I know this area really well. You just kind of go, no, clearly it's not that. <laughs> what, what, what planet is that on that? That's that name. Yeah, so there we go. Cheers, guys. <laughs>